Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramph. We are joining you live here June 21st, 2024, uh, offering you some information that's happening this weekend, things you can do, things that are going on. Yesterday was the solstice. Um, we, uh, the Under One Roof team, uh, with the partnership between MCAT, Living Lab, uh, Families First and Spectrum Discovery Center all went up over to Sealy Lake to do an Under One Roof Road Show, which went, was a big success. I, I managed to uh, take a side quest with some of my crew that went up there and went up to uh, Gus, the very large tree that's up in Sealy Lake. Got a nice picture of the area. And yeah, that's my backdrop for today. Uh, yesterday was a solstice. Uh, it was the longest uh, day of the year, kicking off the summer. Now it's all downhill from here. All right, let's kick things off with uh, uh, no CD Council la uh, this last Monday. We had Juneteenth this Wednesday. But for this particular segment, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper to Committee of the Whole, which spent about three hours over an ordinance, which would give teeth to a resolution that was passed last City Council meeting in which they wanted to create a buffer zone for camping in the city of Missoula. Mayor Andrea Davis introduces this topic with a little bit more information. And as you all know, we went oh, February through one. May holding five different five-hour sessions. And I'm just queuing up sort of where we are and how we got here today. Um, I think that it's important to reiterate that to date, the city of Missoula, um, it's been illegal to camp in the city of Missoula. And we have more or less been allowing it because we know that people are under some very challenging and extenuating circumstances. The resolution that was passed by council on Monday night basically allows for exceptions within the existing camping rule. And that means that folks are allowed to camp with the exception of those buffer, those identified buffers. The ordinance today um, that will be contemplated and discussed, if eventually passed, will replace the existing camping ordinance. So I want to be explicit with people how this is how this works. Um, and so, fortunately, uh, Mr. Sudbury will walk through this in much more eloquence than than I will. But I did. And uh, speaking of Ryan Sudbury, the uh city attorney. Uh, he spoke a little bit more about some of the areas. Essentially, the mayor stated that the city allowed for urban camping, regardless of how they phrased it last year when the city uh, referenced the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals as they were trying to figure out wiggle room through laws and this working group. City Attorney Ryan Sardisbury spoke more on how the city will put this into local rules and how designated camping isn't the direction the city wants to go. Um, and so without further ado, here is Ryan Sudsbury talking about the existing Montana Missoula code on this. We've uh, decided not to recognizing the need in the community for additional uh, camping locations and places outside the shelter um, for people that, that the shelter may not be an ideal uh, situation for them. I guess it's not ideal for anybody, but, but may not work um, uh, for them at all. So we've uh, attempted to take that into account this ordinance will repeal this provision and replace it with a suite of regulations that provide uh, rules governing where and when people can camp. And uh, in, in looking at other jurisdictions around Montana, there is uh, uh, nobody that has adopted an ordinance like the one that's before you today. Most of the other municipalities, all of the other uh, large municipalities, all the, the cities, uh, have rules that close parks to overnight use and thereby make them uh, uh, unlawful to be used by the unhoused for overnight sheltering. Uh, All right, and so uh, the city is working on a resolution with this uh, thing in which they're going to create some overnight sheltering. And so Ryan Sudsbury continues, and here is a map of some of the areas. For example, Kwan's Park, which is in downtown Missoula, in which he has highlighted in um, uh, kind of purplish hot pink, in which people can stay and then the park boundaries are in yellow. So here is what uh, he's talking about a little bit more about some of the camping boundaries when they're gonna basically ban uh, camping between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, we pulled together a map of one example of Kiwanis Park where uh, the areas outlined in Magenta would be available for overnight camping. In our sort of informal review, there are locations like this throughout uh, most of the larger is sort of medium and larger sized parks in the city. There are also uh, non-park city lands that would be outside uh, with areas that would be outside the buffer zones that would be open to overnight camping pursuant to the terms of the ordinance. All right. And so as you can see here, you see 
come a couple of the areas around here. They just wanted to show that as a basic example of the designated times and designated places and the, all sorts of kinds of things like that. Um, so, you know, when we get further into the topic, Ryan also talks about examples of zones where homeless can camp overnight, but as soon as 8 a.m. rolls in, those places become illegal. Uh, and with this, um, actually, hold on a second, let me go back to my notes. Um, you know, it's not a permanent solution, but an area that is provided by toilet and trash bins for cleanup while they are uh, enforced people to clean these areas at the time uh, when it's between the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. cutoff. This is a temporary camping and will not allow camping, uh, allow for camp city type living. However, for the people who have vehicles and wish to park, they have permits that are for 30 days on limited spaces, but have room for two extensions for up to 90 days for using public uh, right away public parking as a way for them to stay. And uh, Ryan Sudsbury actually gives a little uh, map overview on where people can park their cars in certain areas. And from right over here uh, on this map that you're about to see um, is essentially up the expressway, um, some of the uh, areas, and uh, Ryan's gonna talk a little bit more about that. And uh, like our, our park property, city staff has done sort of an informal review of locations that would be available for uh, permitted RV camping. As you can see in the red areas, these places are outside the buffer zones and the ordinance. This is uh, off expressway. Um, again, another location sort of in Midtown. Uh, the, the red circles would be places where uh, RV permitted camping could occur. If you look in some of these areas, um, some of these areas would have uh, area within the right of way that is outside the street that would also technically be city property that would be available to overnight tent camping so there are uh, places around the city that for both of these types of overnight sheltering to occur all right and that's like one of the biggest topics that a lot of people have been uh, complaining about and asking for and everything like that and most of these issues you just want to mitigate is trash and minimize high traffic areas and residences i saw some campers in front of home depot along the those cross streets for example however there is no comprehensive map for people to go to us now, nor to be pointed in the right direction. That was probably the first time I've ever seen any kind of map where they would show any kind of like zoning in any kind of thing. So we have a homeless individual, Weed White Stone, who gives public comment and talks a little bit more about just uh, more of this designated areas to camp at. Have you ever considered allowing the homeless to uh, have their own, I mean, have their own camp sovereignty of uh, individual sovereignty as well and allow them to actually function as an individual and as a group of, of houseless people to actually uh, you know help keep each other accountable clean stuff of that nature um, putting it all on the staff of the city incurs more what do you call that uh, not only monetary but also time constraints on them that they may have other duties that would be better off them doing. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's been one of the many arguments is just basically I have a place of autonomy for a lot of homeless individuals to stay at. Um, one of the things is that Reserve Street Encampment was there for quite a while. County decided to pull that completely. And the city, uh, instead of, like, kicking everyone out, they try to incentivize it by creating that uh, a designated campsite, which would be next to the Walmart. And that one was kind of its own thing because th during that particular time, there was a lot of public comment uh, complaining about some of the uh, things that were going on at the campsite. And so the city had to be like, okay, the liability is just way too much. And so this kind of just go to show that the city was just not prepared to take on the, uh, the immense responsibility when it comes to uh, handling a, a large group of uh, people who, you know, who are having difficulty with all sorts of issues beyond mental health, substance abuse, and more. So in the past, uh, so Sage Bennett, uh, during public comment, residents spoke against these resolutions and the adoption of the ordinance, and this is what she had to say. At the city's working group, there was a lot of conversations around perceived and actual safety concerns. The folks who stayed with you all till 4 a.m. and continue to show up to these meetings do so because we are worried about the actual safety concerns that arise with this ordinance. We stayed till 4 a.m. and continue to show up because we know that this ordinance directly contributes to physical harm, psychological harm, and death of members of your community. 
and then penalize those members of your community for simply existing and attempting to survive. This is not an exaggeration, and I don't say this to be performative um, or for shock value. I say this because it's based in fact. We have data and research that backs up these claims. It is not just an opinion. In fact, you just heard from the community about a death that occurred last night at a shelter. Um, I even spoke to a woman on Monday who told me about her friend who passed away from hypothermia two blocks from here. Yep. And so those are just one of the many stories and many of the reactions as parts of the community. We have uh, Stephanie Land, the author who made that Netflix show, talks a little bit more about her struggles and how all the city is doing with their uh, uh, attempts to help curb this issue. We were homeless when my daughter was seven months old. After endless emotional abuse, her dad became violent and I left with only $200, no job and no childcare. I was grateful to have a car where we could nap and eat and store our things. We lived in a camper parked in my dad's driveway until I found us a place in a shelter where my daughter started crawling and eventually took her first steps the day before her first birthday. It's impossible to discuss domestic violence without acknowledging its close connection to homelessness. A recent study from the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence found that 57% of women who are homeless attributed domestic violence as the primary reason for lacking shelter. This percentage escalates to a staggering 80% if the woman has a child in her care. Yet right. the and that was Stephanie Land talking uh, more about her experiences of being homeless and being a single mom. Uh, in many cases, family is a hidden safety net against homelessness, and the prospect of getting kicked out is not fun, especially when it comes to individuals who have a substance problems, which meth at the time was a precursor to many people being kicked out of their homes. However, in these challenging economic times, service for providers are being stretched thin, and those lucky enough to have cars are a step above the rest in terms of circumstances. S.J. Howell, Executive Director of Missoula Women Votes, talks about uh, this ordinance, and she's also a member of House District 99-2, um, and she talked about the working group that signed against the resolution um, when they were uh, passing this on Monday, last Monday. I don't feel like my experience uh, or my participation in the working group is well represented in this ordinance. Of course, my bigger concern than the process is the ordinance itself. The primary common ground that I found with other members of the working group, and I found it again and again and again, was wanting to move forward in a way that would work. I feel that this ordinance ultimately is not effective. People need a place to be. Um, we know that there are more people living unsheltered than can be handled at J Street. And I would also just note that we heard again and again the folks in the J Street neighborhood saying that the impact on their neighborhood was untenable. And so for, for me to hear J Street lifted up as the solution for folks um, really doesn't make a lot of sense. All right. We'll move on to, um, you know, in... Um uh, 10 out of the 25 people in the working group signed the a, a minority report on this, saying that they were against the resolution. And uh, she went on to talk about how she was happy the city is working on a map outside the buffer zones for people to go. Uh, but many comments suggest the a proactive approach on data and wayfinding for these folks is beneficial. Jill Bonney, Palvarello Center Executive Director, talks about the strain of homelessness on people firsthand and how the city is working counter to the their mission. And we did have a client pass away. Um, and he passed away in front of Winds of Change. And it was our staff that had that reported to them. It was our staff that identified the body. And that location would have been in a buffer zone. So I'm just really grateful that it happened there and not at a triangle in a park. Um, also, I just respectfully request that the hot team get removed out of the ordinance. It's listed under enforcement and I know it's under um, outreach but if you could just remove it and leave it as outreach, I think that would be great. Um, I'm not sure how this is gonna work with them going out every day. If people have to move every day, I'm not sure how they're gonna go out and do outreach in advance of asking people to move. So I think we need to figure that out. And that, 
brings me to the end of this, and that's um, I haven't heard from any of you about this ordinance. And so between now and the 24th, I'm just inviting all of you to reach out to me because I would love to have a conversation. And I really think we can come to a compromise. All right. So that was Jill Bonney, the executive director of the Paul Varela Center. And she's been very stressed and talking a little bit about uh, a lot about this uh, in past meetings. Um, and the POV had a struggle with turning people away and putting people on a wait list since the pandemic and, and has not slowed down since the uh, much of the money was used to create a system that is now uh, not being funded. As we get into the weeds of the ordinance, uh, council members look to adjust the ordinance to reflect the recommendations uh, for the public. Uh, Danny Carlin of City Council talks about personal property on sites and a little bit more about some of the amendments he wants to add and change for this uh, ordinance. Uh, the first one, the intent is to um, have the city uh, hold on to people's property and have less discretion about what will be held and not held. Um, I think as it's currently written, it, there's just, um, I still believe that the city is going to throw away people's tents and or slash them. So I'd like to just cross out um, this section that talks about what items are eligible to be held in storage or not. I think if the city's going to move everybody's items, I think we should just hold all of their items. Um, but I'm still open to keeping this so we don't hold on to hazardous items as currently specified. So basically, I just want to get rid of all the eligibility requirements to keep people's personal property and instead just keep their personal property as long as it doesn't fall under um, Section 7.2 here. So that's my First Amendment. Okay. All right. And as we go further into this meeting, you know, he put a bunch of resolutions down. And one of the big things that were taken away from this particular one was the idea that not uh, giving fines to homeless individuals who are camping or illegally camping according to the resolution, um, thus creating a less than zero uh, debt, which is even harder on them to do this, uh, especially when they're trying to get in housing and waiting for uh, uh, things to go through and not having to go through the court system as a result. I think the, you know, like the city of Missoula already dealt with this like 10 years ago in which they wanted to eliminate a lot of those fines for those kind of camping deals just because you know, you give somebody who has no money fines and they can't pay for it and then they can't even get a job because they don't have their identification, social security number, no connection whatsoever. And yeah, it's just a whole nother uh, mess in and itself. So um, one of the residents over the phone, uh, Chris uh, Palatano, a uh, resident talks about the uh, amen amendment on eliminating the fines in the first place. And this is what he had to say. Um, I did just want to, because perhaps I don't know if this was an oversight or thought of um, just put in there that um, the officer who is giving a citation for a municipal infraction um, under 714150 has to specify in the citation um, a penalty for failure to appear in court. Um, and that's built into the statute. Um, and I just, I, I haven't heard that discussed. Um, and we know sort of failure to appear affects all sorts of populations. It is particularly something that affects the unhoused community um, and then wraps people further in the criminal justice system. So I just didn't know if there was a plan for how to deal with failure to appear in this context. Um, or right. And that was a, that's actually a big uh, point he made right there. The failure to appear in court is a huge infraction. And a lot of people in the county jail are, um, you know, I like sometimes I like to scam county jail to see if anyone I know there. But that, that besides the point, um, when you look on there and you see that there's a failure to appear, it's like, oh, you can get thrown in jail for failure to appear. That's crazy. And so, you know, even if it's as simple as a little fine here and there. So it's 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 very interesting. But there is uh, teeth behind not showing up to a person's court date where pursuing individuals who violate the law as written and not showing when summoned. Uh, Christian Jordan, uh, city council, who has been outspoken against a lot of this resolution and how the city has been moving forward on this, uh, speaks on this matter. I have not been consulted in the creation of this ordinance ever. The second point I want to make is that Mr. Sudbury implied that this is a good ordinance because it's the, it's the least draconian approach in the state. And I just want to say, folks, Montana is a conservative state where the progressive bar is so low, we don't even have to check ourselves. This ordinance would be better if it followed nationwide best practices, not the needs of the housed privileged class. Third, the sponsors keep saying they feel 
they feel that this is the most humane compromise, so it's the best way forward. I just want to say I'm really glad that you all feel that way because you're going to have to stand behind all of the fallout when we see the intended consequences of this ordinance. These intended consequences include case managers not being able to find their clients, increased interactions between the unhoused and law enforcement, and increasing the privilege of the housed community to not have to see the unhoused. Fourth, like one of the public speakers, I did also move to Missoula as a single mom, specifically because it seemed like a caring, compassionate community. And I just want to know where that compassion for unhoused neighbors is gone. Where is it? Where's this compassion? The word, the worth of the unhoused is defined by the sponsor's lack of a humane approach um, afforded to the housed. Um, fifth, regarding keeping the town nice for tourists, they're the biggest financial drain on our community. They drive our roads, they call 911, and they they don't pay for it. Our tax dollars go to the state for redistribution, and we see very little of that. For All right, and then the, one of the major points is uh, from that uh, uh, deal is that the takeaway from this ordinance is, frankly, finding people to a point of beyond feasibility paying these off with, let alone save money for for transitioning into housing, which may ask for triple deposit in terms of people who have a gap in renting history, not to mention public defenders would be put on a strain uh, through local taxes to defend individuals in these situations beyond these fines. Many uh, are, uh, uh, amendments failed in the process from buffer zones, but designated campsites on city property got the yes vote at the uh, discretion of the mayor. Towing was reduced from three strikes to two strikes and you're towed um, instead, of, instead of fines for, uh, for community service for those amendments passed to uh, punish, not to hinder a person financially. The big one Daniel added wanted to this uh, wanted uh, to the, have the city hold items longer in storage for individuals to claim failed adjustments were made and one of the bigger changes was fines for community service. So this will come forward in the future public hearing next Monday and it will definitely be a doozy because a lot of people I've been hearing are uh, gathering up for this big uh, meeting on Monday where they plan to pass the. Uh, ordinance which will give law enforcement teeth in breaking up a lot of these encampments so uh, moving forward we're going to uh, show some promos for you guys of some of the things that are going to be airing on mcat this week and you can watch it now on um, mcat's youtube channel as soon as i play it supreme court one of the first ones involved that um, list of environmental rights. The first one, the right to plead and helpful. The other, the right to acquire and possess property. As someone brought a lawsuit challenging this junkyard. Um, I've just randomly picked a junkyard picture, but saying that violated their right to clean and helpful environment. And the, the junkyard owner said, but there's also this right to possess my property. And the court said, w they're both protected by the Constitution. And when you have two rights, um, that are intention, you balance them. And we balance them in a way that the right to a healthful environment gets more weight. You spent years advocating for the restoration of this line. And now you are putting pen to paper in new ways to build the plan, the budget, and the timeline that can turn that advocacy into results. For our part, the Biden-Harris administration will continue to invest in passenger rail so that we can expand service to more parts of the country and grow a safer, cleaner, more equitable and reliable rail system. And as this group knows so well, we're making good progress on the Amtrak daily long distance service study, which is bringing us even closer to restoring previously discontinued lines and creating new ones too. This is an extraordinary time and marks the beginning of a new era for American rail. Together we can rise to this moment and bring efficient, reliable, long distance passenger rail to more communities across the United States. You got to learn to be a bird, to fly alone and free. You got to learn to be a bird, you can't just follow me. For there's a big, big world out there, it's waiting just for you. You've got to learn to be a bird and learn what birds can do. When I see you flying in the sky so wild and free, I think that's what I'd like to do. A bird is what I'd like to be. But I've got to learn to be myself and do what I can do. I've got to learn to be myself. I can't just
angels follow you. For there's a big, big world out there just waiting for you and me. We've got to learn to be ourselves if we want to be free. City Band, which performed this week for their first week on Wednesday for Juneteenth. But uh, they also had their first uh, big band show, which happened the week before, and it will start airing on MCAT pretty soon, just not too soon, because they want to make sure that they're promoting their uh, out in the park. So it happens every single Wednesday for the summer until mid-August, every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., Bonner Park, which is not in Bonner, it's in Missoula. All right, moving on, let's kick things off with some pre-critic where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my biases towards movies what in general being fairly uncreative, but they're throwing it back to a kind of a 1950s, 1960s Easy Rider kind of movie called The Bike Riders. We have the answer to Blue Angels, Easy Rider, and The Wild One, uh, where a group of motorbike gangs were at the peak in and around the 60s following a girl who falls in love with one of the bikers who is so anti-establishment he basically gets into fight with anything else and that a normal life with a gal is more dangerous than leaving the growing illegal world of motorcycle gangs. So roughly it's the same story of strong personalities, tests, loyalties, and betrayal in this period piece where societies reject the power of a small militia. Uh, I assume many of them die and fade off in memory as their legend will influence people to ride bikes for Toys for Tots. Um, following that, we also have the exorcism. Uh, fat off the communion wine, uh, Russell Crowe is back with another exorcist tale from what he just said is the James Bond of possession world where demons take over the body of innocent children or people looking for attention or even more realistic mental major medical interventions that fail. And we got this priest. So this movie is essentially about a priest going on to a movie set about an exorcism which actually becomes a real exorcism so it becomes a, a, an exorcism within an, within an exorcism. Cool, right? All right, so moving on, we have this other movie. I think I've, I've talked about this before, but it's called Thelma. Have you ever b had an aging adult who's been scammed? This movie is where the aging woman takes the power back and goes after the person who scammed her uh, of giving tens of thousands of dollars to the scammer, sets out on a journey to get that money back in a dangerous world of fake telephone calls. Watch as an old woman learns to navigate the internet with hilarious results, because that seems to be a go-to with writing. It's like, our iPhone? stuff like that. But while this comedy brings home the same narrative, if you get a call to wire money directly, don't. Make sure you follow up with the police in the matter if you have somebody who's been arrested. All right. We have a new dub and stuff for you guys from the 1960 movie, A Touch of Larceny. And without further ado, here's this. So what? You're just going to stand there? Hop on in. Hmm. So, um, uh, <clears throat> So where are we going anyways? Oh! Hmm, that hat might be too much for ya. Hmm, let me just adjust here. You know, I went on this trip because I felt sorry for you. And all this wind, all this stuff. Uh... Could you have gotten like a cabin or something? Hold on. Uh, when I was young, my, uh, parents used to take me out driving in these areas. It was, uh... Hmm? Well... Hmm. Well, I can't wait to have, like, 30 children. Uh, uh, I grew up from a big family. You understand that, right? We had, like... Uh, no. Oh. Oh. Um, maybe we shouldn't be doing this after all. After all, you're Anglo and I'm Saxon. I won't hold that against you. 
Nope, not gonna bother me at all. Mm, 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 mm. All right, here we are. That's a lot of boats. Do you own them all? Uh, no. Well, then, how can you afford our 60 kids? 60? Well, my daddy owned a bunch of boats. Well, you know, boatflation. It's, uh, you know, I can't own all the boats. I only own one of those boats right over there. See? All right, one boat, Charlie. Uh, I've told you many times, my name is Dan. Is that short for Danthan? Because I once knew a Danthan. He didn't pay for a salad. Ah, uh, where we're going, we don't need salads. Oh, not even a sea cucumber? Uh, well, we'll see what we can do. But come on, let's go. All right, don't, don't get my hopes up about a sea cucumber. You know, they're not a real vegetable, by the way. Well, then, maybe I oh, shouldn't go. Oh, come on. It's no big deal. Oh, uh, you know, I left it's something just, on the stove. Come on, we're I, just going to go on the lake. Who cares? See? with and around the city of Missoula it's time for your Missoula events.net uh, reflection so yoga for healthy aging so Red Willow they have a cancer support community and they do this uh, most days and during the week Red Willow is a learning center very much like the lifelong learning center but it's geared towards educational classes cooking classes and many other things like yoga uh, stroller strides for mommy and me type classes at Bonner Park where they do the city band like I mentioned um, 9.30 uh, every uh, weekday at Bonner Park. Um, Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium, they have their predator feeding at 10.30 a.m. with a opening at 10 a.m. where they show a bunch of new butterflies. Most of the butterflies uh, only live for anywhere between two to six weeks depending upon their uh, species. They have a bunch of species they bring in every day and they always hatch and they uh, uh, fly around. It's a beautiful place. Uh, definitely highly recommend those that area as well family fun time so as you know the weather is starting to get a lot warmer uh, this might be the last week for cold weather so if you're interested in staying indoors they have Mismo Gymnastic Roots Zachary Sports Center they have uh, Catch Air the uh, the follow-up to the Flying Squirrel uh, they also have the YMCA as a great indoor venues for people who want to get out of the elements who just have an indoor place where they're so close to amenities so they can get some water and go to the bathroom Missoula Food Bank Meal Distribution. This is a great way for people to get uh, access to cheap and nutritious food here in the city of Missoula at the Missoula Food Bank, which is off Wyoming Street right next to the Bowling Alley. Uh, Tiny Tales, at, uh, they're doing this at Lowell School too. So if, they're don't, if they can't do it outside, they'll do it inside Lowell School. Tiny Tales is also hosted here at the Missoula Public Library at 10.30 a.m. Yarns at Missoula Public uh, Library on the fourth floor in the Botsport Board Room. If you're interested in just stitching crocheting and you want to be around people to do it, they do it every single Friday at noon. Hands-on science, elemental exploration. Spectrum Discovery Center is uh, hosting elemental exploration. Learn about the elements. This is an event that starts at 2 in the afternoon, but their science exhibits are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Missoula Greek Festival. This is a big thing that's happening all week long. This is their Greek Orthodox Church. They're doing a Greek Fest happening at Rose Park, kicking off this afternoon at 3 p.m. They'll do it all weekend long. Check it out. Um, young Adult Writer Group. This is an also a Missoula Public Library exclusive to help encourage young writers to get into writing. And this is at the Art Box on the second floor every Friday at 3.30 p.m., plus a bunch of other things. Um, MCT, Missoula Children's Theater, is hosting a uh, camp this week, and they're going to be putting in performances at 4 p.m. and at 6 p.m. Two different performances from two different casts. Great way for kids to uh, shine for their parents as they wrap up their uh, summer camp. MCAT will be starting our summer camps in July. We usually take June for any kind of vacation or some time off as we get into the later summer months. Uh, summertime Lego Club, the second floor in the Imaginarium starting at 4 p.m. It's a uh, summertime Lego Club. Also, the Missoula Public Library hosts a food distribution here at the Public Library starting at 11.30 a.m. to about 1 p.m. on the second floor. You get a brown bag and you go off. Um, Britt Ar Arninson and Damian Margo is going to be at an Imagination Brewing Company playing from folk music starting at 6 p.m. Missoula Mini Golf Summer 2024 at the Warehouse Mall. It's a, a public play. Missoula Mini Golf is a startup pop-up fun time for all ages. And it's going to be located at 725 Tool Avenue at the Warehouse Mall starting at 6 p.m. Matt Kearney at the Wilma is going to be playing some rock music. 
starting at 7 p.m. Sundog North at the Old Post, playing at 7 p.m. Um, various music, multi-genre, sponsor and volunteer appreciation. So this is for folks who help with the pride efforts and pride helpers who help build up the stages, tear some things down. Um, and so they're gonna be doing at the Sinful Lounge at 7 p.m., which is at 426 North Higgins for the pride helpers. Uh, Gorgantrotone, uh, uh, Casket Robbery, Voroth, and uh, Blessedo Blessedoom is going to be at Dark Horse Bar, and as you heard from those names, they're definitely going to play them some rock music. Karaoke at the Jack Sloan at 7 p.m., Sgt. Pepper and the Magical Mystery Piano at 7.30 p.m. at the Union, and the Benevolence and the Galactic Axis in Austin, Britain is going to be at Zootown Arts Community Center doing some folk and rock. Uh, we have some uh, ticket sauce at Cranky Spam uh, Public House playing some funk music. Off Pitch is going to be doing some karaoke at the Odd Pitch Brewery. Uh, they also have a bunch of pinball tournaments throughout the weekend. Always want to check those out. Uh, uh, Christopher Paul Stelling is going to be playing some Monk, doing some multi-genre music starting at 8 p.m. Cash for Junkers, who will be at Union Club. Muddy Creek Band is going to be playing some country music at the Sunrise Saloon at 9.30 p.m. And that will wrap up your Friday. And as we jump right into your Saturday, as always, Saturday markets are from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. every single Saturday all summer long, well until late October. Great way for get some produce and fun stuff. Not to mention huckleberries will be coming into season pretty soon, so we'll get some huckleberries. There's some people who actually throw some huckleberries over the season to get curb the market so they can get some good income from that as well. It's a great opportunity. They always have these clinics to help people start a, f a Saturday market as well. So Crafty Pants Craft Fair, American Legion Hall is hosting a craft fair. Check it out, starting at 9 a.m. Uh, sewing, crochet, knitting, paper craft, and more. Missoula Senior Center is also doing a parking lot sale starting at 9 a.m. at the Missoula Senior Center. Crusade in the Park, Karis Park. Uh, bring your family for a packed of day of watching God do things. Bring yard games, have a pray that needs answered. Uh, let them pray with you. God loves to demonstrate his power or just wants to spend some time worshiping. So if you want to stop by, Karis Park is doing that at 10 a.m. Moon Randolph Homestead is doing open hours at 11 a.m. It's a great way to look at uh, an old homesteading uh, property that still exists to, to the day. Uh, Mizzou Museum Tour, Mizzou Art Museum does this usually every uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. It's a great opportunity to connect with the Mizzou, uh, Mizzou Art Museum and get a tour. Summer Learning Program, Makerspace, Home Resource Fix-It Clinic, Mizzou Public Library starting at 11 a.m. to bring your items uh, that you'd like to learn how to fix, outdoor gear, bikes, lights, you name it, and the Home Resource Couches will help teach you how to fix it. Nature journaling, uh, journal, journaling at the summer solstice, so it already happens. Milltown State Park is doing a thing from noon to about 2 p.m. at the Milltown State Park Confluence Center. If you ha it's up in Bonner. So if you have ever thought about starting and keeping a nature journal, this is your opportunity starting at noon on Saturday. Saturday Kids Activity, so this is a Montana Natural History Center, is doing a thing for geologist enthusiasts for an excited series to touch and learn sessions in geology. Master Naturalist and Geology Earth Sciences educator Jamie Watson will be leading these drop-in sessions. Uh, and they usually do these kind of things 1 to 3 p.m. every Saturday, very much like how MCAT used to do our uh, Saturday drop-ins, which we're taking a hiatus for for the summer. 12th anniversary party. So the Har Grizzly Harley-Davidson store has been open for 12 years, which is kind of crazy for sure. I remember them being open a little bit longer, but still, they're off Airport Vol Boulevard and it starts at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Mount Erie is going to be uh, uh, doing a performance at Zootown Arts Community Center featuring uh, with uh, Sung Mountain and Dylan Running Crane uh, starting at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Artists Talk, John Paquito Shake, The Raw Goddess at the Confluence Center starting at 2.30 p.m. Potomac Puzzle Exchange. So if you're interested, the Missoula Public Library is uh, doing a puzzle uh, exchange here at the Public Library and they're welcome to exchange their gently used puzzles to new to them puzzles, stop by the Potomac branch to take one slash leave one and mingle with friends and neighbors while enjoying light snacks and beverages. Vampire Weekend is gonna be performing this weekend at the Kettle House Amphitheater, night one, and they're gonna do a matinee on Sunday, uh, but tonight at 5.30, I mean Saturday at 5.30 p.m. is a great opportunity to do that. The Queens and Mr. G, Imagination Plays Folk Music, anchored a collaborated aerial experience at Westside Theater, so a lot of times they do aerial silks at the Westside Theater is a great opportunity to check that out. And it's basically people who have, you know, aerial silks is like they have silks hanging from the ceiling. People climb up there, they do spins and stuff. It is uh, quite, quite captivating. Uh, Northern Lights Band at the Jack Saloon. Uh, Jack Saloon is be hosting country rock music uh, Saturday night. Uh, BFW is doing some reggae ska music starting at 8 p.m. 
uh, uh, with Epic Net with Ijabar, and Pay No Mind. Uh, James McMurdy uh, with Bonnie Whitmore is going to be at Zootown Arts Media Center playing some country music at 8 p.m. on Saturday. Karaoke with SLA and 9, Mudside Charlie at Union Club, Karaoke at the Dark Horse Bar, Chris Moon, Badlander at 10 p.m., Missoula Summer Maid Fair is happening at the Care Spark on Sunday starting at 10 a.m. Great opportunity to uh, just do craft fair, maid fair, all a bunch of things to buy some stuff that people have made. Uh, rain Barrel Workshop, Missoula Urban Demonstration Project. They're doing rain go away. Uh, so rain uh, on the new barrel. Don't miss out on this hands-on opportunity. Upcycle a leftover 35-gallon syrup drum donated by Coca-Cola into a handy reservoir for your yard. When complete, your barrel will collect rainwater from your uh, downspout for use in your garden, and they'll be perfect size for a smaller space. It is a win for your plants, watershed, and more. Plants Church at the Milltown Overlook. Milltown Overlook uh, State Park is doing a landscape that overlooks the long history of varied relationships with Missoula Valley. The flowing confluence of the Clark Fork and Blackfoot Rivers, the mill, and interstate herbalism has a long-standing tradition of apprenticeships and learning from elders, and many is the modern-day herbalist who has wished that they have learned an old had a wise old grandma who gnarled hands, big heart, to guide them in learning the ways of local plants. Uh, summer learning program at the Missoula Public Library, they're doing adventures in zine making. For decades, punks, poets, and other adventurous self-publishers have created zines to make their voices heard, and you can too. And this is happening at the Public Library on Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, and then wrapping things up for sa Sunday night, uh, Daisy Chain presents Glitter Fox, uh, Les Duck, and uh, Queen Anger. It's going to be at Zootown Arts Community Center. It's a Portland-based uh, band, Glitter Fox, has released five singles in just six months under the new record label, Kill Rock Stars. Very funny weekend comedy, open mic, VFW every Sunday at 8, uh, 8 p.m., and then karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon at 8.30 p.m. All sorts of fun things happening this weekend long. But last weekend, we had the Pride Parade, and I'm going to give you a little taste of a Missoula Pride right now.
My bad. Welcome back. That was Pride Parade. If you want to check it out, you can check it out on the YouTube page and more. Okay, so I have a little bit more time in my show, which I usually devote towards news, things that are happening in the world today beyond. Montana's for election reform got some signatures to update the election to allow for more independent leaders to rise in our communities. Essentially, this is ranked choice voting, but as we look into the past, Montana legislation, we had brought this up to the House uh, Republicans as a push to deter John Tester's efforts in the primary, to which they, if you further study, found it harder to get rid of him this way as thus killed the bill. And uh, forms of this bill would rise with petitioners on the street to have voters put this on the ballot, in which they did. The first initiative, CI-126, would essentially replace Montana's current party-based June primary election with a fully open primary, so anybody can vote for anybody. Uh, the second, CI-127, would have the secure 50% of the vote in the November election or have a runoff later down the road. So essentially it is ranked choice voting. Uh, City of Missoula had the week off because of Juneteenth, but coming out of this week, the city will implement an ordinance to enforce urban camping by giving teeth to local services to remove and cite individuals for unlawful camping on city property, which includes parks and adding to health department's recommendation of river access buffers to prevent camping near and around the river. Uh, June 24th, we'll see another expected long meeting for the city council meeting to discuss items as summer tourism season rounds the corner. In other news, Missoula Public Library won an award for interior design for the third year in three years from the International Interior Design Association for Best Interior Design for Large Public Libraries, which is considered 30,000 square plus feet. Um, we share this award with the Sh Shanghai Library east of Shanghai, China, as we are grateful for our brilliant architects, MSR Design, and their local partners in a and &E for expertly transitioning the Missoula community's vision for a world-class library into an iconic reality. Most of those buildings and interior finishes and many of the original furni uh, furnishings are red list free. That has made of materials of minimized nasty chemicals that impact human health and wellness as new furnishings are introduced into the public, into the building. This aspect of sustainability, housing sustainability should remain a priority. Um, Missoula Public Library is increasingly highlighting the indigenous culture in the building's permanent art collection, rotating art galleries, programming, and coming soon, interpretive signage that will connect our building and MC, MPL's mission to indigenous values, history, and experience in the region. This new enhancements will give library users of all backgrounds a sense of, of, uh, of sense and pride of both place and deep time. Uh, you know the old uh, Monty uh, um, uh, mascot over at the old University of Montana? Looks like they are being honored and enshrined in the Mascot Hall of Fame. And since 2019, this has been kind of been a, a normal thing for the nation to kind of do. A lot of times these mascots were just like pep rally kind of creations to help booster morale for people to support their teams. And they kind of got included within teams. And essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because a lot of like cheerleaders and mascots are kind of pushed to the side for like the more athletics. Uh, but for some of the mascots giving as far as Bending the bull from Chicago to clutch of the Houston Rockets. Um, these are the, some of the mascots that used to perform as Monty that moved on to a bigger organizations. A uh, total of 33 mascots have been in, in inducted into the Mo Mascot Hall of Fame. Monte is the 10th NCAA mascot and the only one from the current FCS institution, which I don't know what that means. Other NCAA institutions to have their mascot included are Auburn, Delaware, Nebraska, Ohio State, Penn State, Syracuse, Tennessee, Western Kentucky, and Wisconsin. The Mascot Hall of Fame was founded in two, uh, 2014 and uh, launched in an interactive exhibit in White, Whiting, Indiana, outside Chicago in 2018. Earlier this winter, it was named the nation's top pop cultural uh, museum of USA Today. And then come some good news coming into the fire season in Montana with the snowpack being low, but moisture is high this spring, and this week could attest to that. The heat wave hitting a good chunk of the United States will briefly pass uh, by places like Missoula looking to get into the upper 80s, even touching 90 degree temps over the weekend. Well, we're, we're at fire season. The state brought up new fire fighting plane in the form of a Chinook fire uh, plane. Uh, which has the capacity of ho uh, holding upwards of 2,500 gallons of water, making the single bucket drops of the past look like a glass of water being thrown at a fire. Uh, the Montana Free Press reported on this, which also stressed the, the, the use of drones and wildfire errors, which last season grounded planes for two days during peak fire season efforts. So with the state and officials fighting these fires are asking freelancers with drones to stay away from these fires. 
Um, so far, the fire danger is moderate, which is a notch above uh, safe. And uh, once late June and early July hit, some of those additional moistures that from May and part of this week may be in vain since once the heat comes, it dries out pretty fast. And you know, speaking of fires, California is on fire in, as the desert town of Sacramento, the post fire in both Los Angeles and uh, Ventura County is one of the biggest spreading over 15,000 acres. It started Saturday afternoon with an 8% containment as of Monday. The cause of the blaze is unknown. In other fire news, Canada is in the reel from fires that spread throughout the western parts of Canada. British Columbia have evacuated from homes as authorities warn that the enormous fire continues to grow. About 3,000 residents in Fort Nelson were evacuated north of Vancouver in northeastern uh, British Columbia. Warmer temps and access to forests are many of these reasons why a lot of those fires uh, allowed to blaze with little to no ground crews to mitigate these fires with Americans and Montanans being hired to help with those efforts. While these fire blaze, uh, Minneapolis is dealing with the smoke as the worst air quality in the region. Hazy skies were seen uh, Sunday, May 12th, 2024 over Cook, Minnesota as smoke from wildfires burning. So I'm giving you more of a retrospect of the fires and latest projections of this 2024 fire season uh, indicate wildfire risk in Canada is expected to remain high over the coming months for much of the uh, country, particularly in regions that continue to experience intense drought, including northwestern Alberta, northeast British Columbia, and south uh, southern Northwest Territories. And the reason why I'm talking about Canada is because all that smoke is going all over the East Coast and swooping on through. So, I mean, th their fires get pretty intense and they got them pretty intense. And just the access to roads and trails, the amenities are very hard for them to put out these fires. And uh, as we even talk more about the climate, activists defaced Stonehenge this week just in time for uh, the solstice uh, to occur at the Stonehenge. The group, uh, known as Just Stop Oil, took credit for Wednesday's action, which said was a call on the United Kingdom to stop the use of fossil fuel by 2030. This is just one of many zero by 30 programs in place to curb fossil fuels and address climate change. Uh, English Heritage, the group that manages Stonehenge, that the, um, said on a post on the site, remains open. It called the incident extremely unsettling and said its curators were assessing the extent of the damage. And the group that put spray painted the orange said it would, they used orange corn flour used as a monument would wash away in the rain. So this is one of many climate protests over the years which have gone viral for their shock tactics from throwing paint and art, gluing their hands to walls and stopping traffic on major streets. Um, the UK has issued new landmark case this week that also targets offshore oil burning. So this is a three to one majority of the Supreme Court judge uh, agreed that under planning law, the assumption that has always been that only the impacts from the constructing the wells and not the use of the final oil products should be considered. And so they're, they're talking a little bit about the downstream effects and the consequences of drilling offshore, offshore oil drilling. And the Supreme Court justices of the UK did not rule that the survey, Surrey County Council should reject the proposal for new oil wells, but that it should have considered the downstream emissions. Um, let's see. All right, so like I said, Thursday was the summer solstice and a full moon for those wondering how to sync with the moon and the tides and everything. Have a good weekend because it's going to get hot out there into the 90s as low as and as the low will rise and many will have maybe will have another cold spell. But summer in the U.S. is kicking off with a vengeance in many other regions in the west, south, eastern parts of the U.S. It kind of feels like uh, Missoula is kind of like in this cusp of this little area in which we're going to get heat, but we're not going to get hot. So uh, but the weather is slightly going down to a nice even keel on average uh, for uh, lows of 80s and the, uh, eight, the 50 degrees overnight going into July. My guess is that we'll have our heat wave into the mid to late July going into August where we'll have at least one rain event during the Western Montana State Fair like we always do. July will be weird for my show too because I will be off the air for most of the summer camps which are geared towards kids eight to 14 and uh, 14 and up camp in August for the horror movie making camp. But who knows, I got called for jury duty at the end of July so I don't know what my schedule is gonna be like because it's gonna be up in the air. So. Without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. And before I actually officially wrap, I want to show you some Space Wave, courtesy of Josh Cook. Mm -hmm.